This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Hello, party people. At the beginning of a new year, many of us want little hacks for getting happier and healthier. You are not going to get that in this episode, however. My guest today argues that the best route to getting unstuck is to first get familiar and cozy with and even laugh at your own ugliness. He doesn't pretend that this is easy. He simply argues it is necessary. Dr. Mark Epstein is one of the most important figures in my own personal development back in 2009, I believe, when I was a super skeptical, although meditation curious, TV news anchor. I read a few of Mark's excellent books about the overlap between psychology and Buddhism. Actually, my wife gave me those books and turned me on to Mark. I then called Mark up and asked him if he would have a drink with me, and we have been friends ever since. Mark has written many, many books. I've read all of them. They're all excellent. But perhaps my favorite is his new one, which is called The Zen of Therapy. In it, he puts you in his chair, in his mind, as he does therapy, using his mix of psychiatric training and decades of studying and practicing Buddhism. In this conversation, we talk about the immense value of developing a clear and warm relationship to your own dysfunction. We talk about anger, how much people can actually change, how Buddhism has influenced Mark's practice as a psychotherapist. And we talk about what was an extremely important, a formative relationship for Mark with the legendary spiritual teacher and ex-academic Ram Das, who wrote the seminal book, Be Here Now, and died a few years ago. One little note here, this conversation was actually recorded live as part of an online benefit for the New York Insight Meditation Center and the Cambridge Insight Meditation Center, two great institutions both worth checking out and supporting. Before we dive in, some big news about a development in the TPH world. We are launching a new podcast. We've actually launched it already. One of the most intense, important, and... Hi, Mark. Damn, what a treat. Congratulations on your new book. It's amazing. I've read it. I loved it. So again, congratulations. Thank you. You're about, I think, one of only three people beyond the editors who have read it already. So I'm like a little nervous to uh, hear what you have to say. I think this is among your best. And what I like about it is you've had books, including Going on Being, among others, that had a memoir aspect to it but you're revealing more and more of yourself. And I don't know what, actually, I'd be curious to hear from you. Why are you, as you get a little older, you're revealing more and more about yourself in your books. And this book is the most revealing. Yeah, that was, I think the urge behind it was to say a little more about what it's actually like to be a, a shrink, to be a, a therapist in a day-to-day -day way. And, um, I remember when I first started to think about writing down a year's worth of psychotherapy sessions, which is what the, the heart of the book is. I didn't know it was going to be a book when I first started writing down the sessions, but uh, I was at a loss for what to do during my writing time. And I was sick of writing the same book over and over again. So uh, I was like, I'm not going to do that. So uh, for about for a year, really, but it, it took nine months of that time. I didn't know that it was going to be a book. I decided that I would try to record the details as much as I could remember after the session of at least one therapy session a week, where I thought that something of my Buddhist background or upbringing or whatever you want to call it, something of my Buddhist leanings filtered into the session. And so I wrote the session down trying to grasp what that might have been, you know, not necessarily the teaching of mindfulness, sometimes that, but more how it infused, if it did, the interaction. After a year of doing that, I showed it to my editor and thought maybe it was the nucleus of, um, of a book. And I was a little nervous about because it, it was all patient stuff. So there was a lot to go through around that. But that was the, the motivating force, at least at the beginning for this book. Just to say more about the motivating force, you write in the book that you set out to answer, and this is a quote, a vexing question. How does my involvement with Buddhism affect my work as a therapist? Why did you not already know that? 
Well, that's the question that everybody w- always asks me. You, you know, like I've written all these books, which I always thought of as trying to translate Buddhism or Buddhist psychology or Buddhist philosophy into the Western, you know, psychodynamic language that we all speak, even if we're not Freudian, that sort of infiltrated our our way of thinking about the mind. So I wanted to talk about Buddhism in that way to make it more accessible to the mental health field and therapists and lay people, et cetera. And then people would always come back with the question, well, okay, okay, that's interesting, but how do you actually use Buddhism in your practice as a therapist? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just like being a therapist. And, you know, the the Buddhist thing is part of me, but I'm not proselytizing when I'm doing therapy. I'm just doing therapy. But yet I know that it's infiltrated somehow. But I was um, reluctant to try to uh, put a stamp on it and say, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know, because I didn't really know what I was doing, except, (laughs) I mean, that's the thing about being a therapist. It's very improvisational. And you have to learn with each person. It's different with each person. So I managed in all of those previous books to more or less evade the question of uh, how do I actually put it to use? And then I thought, when I was writing down these sessions, I thought, oh, I'm like in my middle to late 60s now. No one's ever going to really know what I've been doing all these years. Like, I'm just going to sort of like disappear sooner or later. Uh, there was an, an ego thing in the uh, in the initial uh, writing, I think, of like, okay, at least I'll, I'll show my hand, you know, this is what it's actually like. And so then I was curious, right, picking out the session, like what session is interesting this week? I didn't follow given patients throughout the year. I, I picked more randomly, like w- whatever seemed like something interesting happened. And then in in actually writing the sessions out and then showing what I had written to the patients because I needed their permission, you know, and changing whatever needed to be changed, I started to see, oh, maybe I am channeling something that uh, perhaps I've learned on all those retreats. Like, what am I doing? So the book is like a chronicle of trying to answer that question. And then I think where I come out I could have known from the beginning, like, what am I, you know? But the process of investigation, I, I I found interesting. So I'm hoping that it works in the book. I can assure you it does work. Sorry, were you going to say something? I, I realized I might have No, just making noises. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of the noises you make while in therapy. It, I talk a lot. Yeah, and, and one of the goals of that talking, by your own admission, is disruption. That's the word you're using. You're kind of trying to disrupt the thinking of your patient. What what, what do you mean by that? That's interesting. You picked out that phrase, disrupting systems. One of my patients is a therapist also, and her session or his or her session, whoever she turned out to be in the book, her session is disguised. But she actually said to me, after reading over what I had written, oh, what you're doing is disrupting systems, you know, like that's where you've helped me. And I was like, oh, that's a good phrase. I couldn't have thought of that myself. So what is that getting at? I think often when people come to therapy, they're coming with explanations about who they are or what's wrong with them or how they see the world or how they see their partners or their children or their parents or their past experience. They're coming with formulations that can never be totally true because I think any individual's history or reality, it can never be totally captured. There's always more to the story than our minds can conceive. And but our minds are are always trying to conceive it, you know, and lock it down. So I think one of the interesting things about being a therapist is that once the relationship is uh, on solid ground and the person trusts me enough that they will confide their systems, you know, or their explanations to me, then I can play with that a little bit. I can sometimes poke holes in it or lighten it with humor, which I think is something I've learned a lot from the uh, 
some of the the best meditation teachers that I've been privy to over the years. You know, the humor thing. You and I share a fondness for Joseph Goldstein, who's New York Insight, Cambridge Insight, all various Vipassana institutions around the country, all inspired by Joseph's sense of humor. And um, uh, Ram Dass's sense of humor, who I talk about in the book a lot, and the Dalai Lama's sense of humor. So I was always excited by that for myself. And I think that's one of the things as a therapist that um, uh, I take chances with, hopefully not making fun of somebody or some situation, but trying to uh, explode it a little bit by getting, uh, changing the perspective on it, you you know, humor being one way of doing that. So that's disrupting systems. I, I think that opens up oh, like, why am I acting this way? Why did I get angry in this situation? Why am I afraid? Why am I ashamed? Shame, especially, I think, is a big one where um, people very quickly, especially when they're young, take responsibility for things that happen to them that really aren't their responsibility, but they internalize it very quickly and then are carrying that in uh, various ways, shame being a big one. So when I can get a hold of that, and uh, change the way that we're looking at that kind of thing, that's extremely helpful for people. And I think that that's very psychodynamic, psychoanalytic, but it's also Buddhist. So it's one of the ways that uh, those worlds can coalesce. That's making me think about the title, the Zen of therapy, because in Zen, there is a, to the extent that I understand Zen at all, there is, I think, an emphasis on spontaneity and to use the word you used several minutes ago, improvisation. And I see that a lot on the page as you're writing about your stance in these sessions. My process of writing the book, maybe it's helpful to uh, talk about that a little bit. My, my process of writing the book was the first year just recording the sessions. And then I had like a a sheaf of papers, like a a notebook, really, of 50 or so of these sessions that I wrote up. And um, I showed them to the the editor at Penguin, who I've done the last two books with, Anne Gudoff, who's like a, a dream editor, at least for me. And she looked at it and read it through and said, I think there's something there. But the only through line is you you know, because you're not following any of the patients. So she said, what you have to do is go through each one of them and write a reflection or a commentary or a consideration or an analysis. She didn't use that word, but, you know, we have to know more about what you're thinking. Then COVID hit. I finished the year's worth in, I think, December of 19. And then COVID hit. So I was like out of my office and up here in Woodstock, where I've been for, you know, the past however many months this has been. And I had more reflection time. So it was actually a very good writing time. So then for that next year, I went through each session trying to write about going back and writing about what I thought was going on. And in doing that, That's when the Zen influence came into the book, because somehow it was actually through, and this is a long story. Do you want to hear, am I talking too much already in this conversation? Interrupt me if I'm (laughs) getting bored. You have no systems I want to disrupt at this point. I like long stories. Feel free. (laughs) Podcasts are meant to be long and rangy, so go for it. Okay, well, several years before, my wife, who is a sculptor, did a big outdoor sculpture installation in Madison Square Park, which is a park in lower Manhattan. And she um, emptied out a stone fountain that usually has water going and made it into a kind of outdoor theater and put uh, various sculptures around. And then uh, once in the fall and once in the spring, she in the fall, she brought the actor Diane Wiest. And in the spring, she brought the actor Fiona Shaw. And they both did a series of unannounced performances. So it was just word of mouth for the better part of the week. They performed for like half an hour in the middle of the day, acting out poetry or, or uh, uh, et cetera. Um, and... Uh, the first day, only a few people were there. And then by the end of the week, there were like big crowds of people because it was incredible. And uh, a friend of mine named Jonathan Cott, who uh, 
some people listening may know. He used to be a, uh, a major writer for Rolling Stone and did interviews, you would know, to interview John Lennon and Dylan and so on. He came and was sitting next to me. And the whole crowd was like, you know, it was like one experience. People were totally focused on the uh, actor in the center of the fountain. And it was, a, you know, a lovely New York City, weird experience. And he quoted a, a, a Zen poem. This is where the story is going. He quoted a Zen poem to me. Um, I think I'll get it right. Under cherry trees, there are no strangers. Or under cherry blossoms, there are no strangers. Because nobody there knew each other, but we were all, you know, having a communal, ex- one cultural experience that was opening everybody's heart, basically. The same way in uh, in the Zen world of the cherry blossoms, people would gather to experience the perfection of the cherry blossoms. So when I started going through the psychotherapy sessions and my reflections on them, each one started to strike me as a kind of a haiku moment, you, you know, like I'm capturing this one moment of therapy and what's the meaning in this one little thing that I'm capturing So I called Jonathan or wrote to Jonathan and I said, remember you quoted that haiku to me, that poem to me, where can I find more? And he gave me like seven books to to look at, you know, the Penguin Book of Zen Poetry, et cetera. And so I started reading the Zen poems while I was going through the psychotherapy sessions. So while the book is the Zen of therapy, what the writing of the book was, what the therapy sessions actually helped me understand the Zen haikus, you know, because I would open it up at random and there would be this beautiful little poem that I would never have paid attention to before. I would find one and it would speak to the essence of the therapy session. So that was extremely exciting to me. And it gave me a, uh, another sort of through line f- through the book that then I realized, okay, I'm trying to bring out, we can't really talk about essence because we're Buddhists, so there is no essence, but I'm trying to bring out the essence of what makes a psychotherapy session worthwhile, you know, like some kind of transmission, some kind of exchange is happening that is disruptive in the way that you were asking about before. Going back to the risks you take. Yeah. Any examples from the book that would be worth talking about now of a risk you take in in the name of this disruption? Well, I think the I think one major risk, this is a more general thing and then I'll give you a specific. A more general risk is that when I feel like it won't be disruptive in the wrong way, I'm quite willing to be real in myself with my patients. So, for instance, until COVID, I always had my office in the in the basement of this uh, five-story uh, uh, loft building that we live in. So patients, when they came to my office, had to walk into the building where we live. And when my kids were little, they would often run into the kids. Uh, my wife had her studio next door to the office. It shared a bathroom. So sometimes the patients would even run into my wife, which in classical psychoanalytic treatment, that would be forbidden. But I was like, I'm not going to hide who I am. And for most people, that was okay. For some people, it was not okay. And then within the sessions, and I think some of that comes through in the book, when I feel it will be helpful and not intrusive, and then that's a judgment call, I'm willing to use my own life and my own experience in the service of uh, trying to make a difference for somebody. And uh, I think some people appreciate that. I know when I was in therapy, I was fortunate enough to have first one and then another therapist who both worked in that way. So that was, um, I was looking for a real relationship as well as a therapeutic whatever the the hierarchy of the thing would be. So I think that thread is there throughout. But in terms of taking a risk, a specific case, I think there's one in the book where one of my patients comes who, uh, there are actually a couple of cases like this, who have suffered a devastating loss and they're putting on a fairly convincing expression of grief but something in the expression of the grief struck me as, I don't know how to say it right, 
not complete, I think. There was something missing. That's what it is. There was something missing in the, in the relating of the grief. So I'm you know, like, what's missing? What's missing? What's missing? And I went for that, you know, like you say you're grieving, but you don't really, somehow it's not coming through. And that turned out to be productive. I was able to get at, I think in one case, an underlying anger and in another case, you know, some other conflicting stuff that was in the way. You talk a lot about anger and aggression and sort of inner violence. Why is that so important? Why is that such a big theme in, in your patients, in your work? Two ways to answer that question. When I was going through the year's worth of sessions, in my mind, I was using the classic Vipassana progress of insight as the framework or as the scaffolding for the book. And the residue of that is there. There, I, I group the sessions according to the four seasons, you know, starting in winter, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And then the, the winter ones, I, um, I started with clinging as the theme that runs through. And then I went to mindfulness as the next one. And then I went to insight as the next one. And then I wanted the fourth one to be about compassion because that's where the book was leading towards a discussion of compassion or of kindness, which is a, the word I decided I preferred. So when I sent it in to my editor, uh, the fourth group was titled Compassion. Only all the sessions were about anger because, and this is the second way of answering the question, I think to really cultivate kindness or compassion or loving kindness there's the classic way of cultivating it that we know from going on retreat. And I've taught with Sharon Salzberg over the years, and she's like the expert at teaching compassion meditation, love and kindness meditation. But from a psychodynamic perspective, the development of compassion is dependent on one's relationship to one's own inner aggression or inner anger. And that comes out of the child psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott, who's the big analytic influence on my work, because he was a pediatrician turned psychoanalyst who focused for the first time in psychoanalytic history, he focused on the experience of, uh, in those days, mothers with their babies. Now men are actually involved with their babies, so it's parents and their babies. And he coined the phrase, the good enough mother or the good enough parent, which has been very important to me in my own work, trying to be a good enough person, good enough therapist. But his whole theory on what makes a parent good enough is that they're able to tolerate both their own anger, their own aggression, and their baby or their child's anger or aggression. And he was always extolling the um, altruistic aspect of parents who are able to, despite all the uh, uh, difficulties, the burdens of uh, having children, and I think this goes to having intimate relationships of all kinds, there's so much anger that's aroused in our intimacies, and that if we're defensive about it, if we're uncomfortable with it, we get blocked up. But if we're able to acknowledge it, work with it, tolerate it, forgive it and come back to the uh, the love that binds us all, the kindness that binds us all, then we're actually able to feel compassion for ourselves and for those who are upsetting us. So all those cases in the fourth part of the book turned out to be examples of people coming with various difficulties around anger that I'm trying to bring into consciousness, into awareness. You know, what we've learned from Buddhism, which is that if you bring anything into awareness, it self-liberates. And that process of self-liberation fills us with a kind of joy and a sense of our own capacity to forgive. That, I think, is the ultimate uh, achievement, if we can talk about achievements coming out of meditation. So I'm trying to channel that into uh, the psychotherapy world. So anyway, after the editor read through that and said, you know, you're saying compassion, but really that seems to be all about anger. I retitled the fourth section as aggression and then wrote a final chapter that is meant to bring everything to a head that's actually about kindness. Much more of my conversation with Dr. Mark Epstein right after this. It's cool when a company that uh, my family and I already use 
asks to be an advertiser on this show. So I was excited when Instacart said they wanted to sponsor 10% Happier because we use it all the time. I recently used it to order ingredients for the smoothie I make every day that feeds me and my wife, Bianca, for lunch. If you want to know the ingredients, it's uh, frozen fruits, banana, almond butter, almond milk, some oats, and Greek yogurt. Super delicious, very healthy. Anyway, Instacart is the leading online grocery platform in North America. And with Instacart, the world is your cart. Fast and flexible delivery in as fast as an hour, or you can order ahead and select a delivery window that works for you. And it's not just groceries. Instacart can also deliver household essentials, pet items, important in our house with three demonic kittens, uh, beauty products, electronics, and more. Get free delivery when you cart your first order on the Instacart app and instacart.com. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Walgreens knows you need your medications, but sometimes what you really need is a prescription for more time with your family or friends or just more time to do what you want on a Saturday afternoon. That's why Walgreens offers same-day RX delivery to where you are. So you can get more than just your meds. You can get your prescription for one less trip to the pharmacy. Deliveries available on eligible prescriptions only. See details at walgreens.com slash prescription delivery. The self-liberating awareness of our inner anger or whatever Misha Goss may be inside or is inside, for sure inside. What's the mechanism by which awareness leads to a self-liberation? Unpack that, if you would. I mean, I think maybe that's something that we have to take on faith. But when I'm saying that, that's totally coming out of my Vipassana experiences. That's totally coming out of listening to Joseph and Jack Cornfield, Sharon, Bob Thurman, Ram Dass, you know, but my own experiences on retreat. Like, what's mindfulness actually teaching us to do? It's to open ourselves uh, as much as we can to what John Kabat Zinn calls the full catastrophe, right? Or in my book, I quote, uh, the psychoanalyst Michael Eigen quoting the British analyst uh, Wilfred Bion as psychoanalysis opening us to the full horror of ourselves, you know, to the great destruction, the ability to outlast the great destruction, you know, that awareness is there behind everything so that whatever we bring into awareness, even our most embarrassing or shame-filled or guilty uh, uh, failures, whatever we can actually bring into the field of awareness and not judge. And I use in the book, I use the, um, the musician and composer John Cage, his, his approach to making music out of non-musical sounds, being open to everything. I try to use that as a way of talking about being open to the the music of our emotions. The experience on retreat of actually doing that is that, and you know this, I think maybe better than I do now, because you've been sitting uh, a lot, but that whatever we take to be most solid, most uh, embarrassing, most, um, you know, et cetera, once it comes up in the field of awareness, once you put the cloak of mindfulness around it, it doesn't last. And it's either just a feeling or just an emotion or just a thought or just a memory. And it flashes. And it, it's not that it might not come again or that we don't identify with it or cling to it. But even the identification with it, we can start to see as a construction. So... The self-liberation of whatever it is that arises is it dissolves into emptiness. You know, that's the classic Buddhist psychology of it. You know, what do we mean by emptiness? That's been debated for thousands of years. But the self-liberation of our identities happens by allowing emptiness to take the foreground. So we sit in meditation, we watch the full catastrophe, the horror, the destruction, 
you know, or as Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, if you sit and watch your own mind long enough, you'll see Hitler. You know, all of this embarrassing, sometimes hilarious, sometimes totally shocking and horrifying content comes up. And just by dint of being with it from a certain open, non-judgmental, even warm angle, we see that it lacks essence, it lacks substance, and in that is the liberation. Yeah, well, the the language that we have to use to talk about that has this visual metaphor running through it. We sit and observe, we see everything that comes up. And I think that that might remove us a little bit too much towards the head, towards the mind. There's this idea that I talk about the mind object that... Uh, when as children we're prematurely challenged by emotional experience that's too overwhelming, we retreat to the mind and create what Winnicott called a caretaker self or a false self to manage the intrusive or abandoning environment that we find ourselves in. So and I think meditation sometimes can be recruited into that. That's a slightly detached or slightly defensive stance. But I think we're also prisoners of our language because when you're doing intensive meditation and this stuff comes up, from my experience anyway, when I'm really with it, it's not so much that I'm just observing it, but it's that it's I'm completely filled by it. Like, oh, did I really do that thing that I'm ashamed of? The memory is there. All the feelings associated with it are there. And then also my attachment to, we would say, or my identification with being that person is there. That's a deeply felt something. So even to have that, I think it's that that ends up coming into a relationship with emptiness. When that deeply felt identification with whatever it is that we are assuming about ourselves, you know, when the holding environment of the mind that comes from shamatha, that comes from concentration, from one-pointedness, when the holding environment is strong enough so that that deeply felt identification that ordinarily is operating behind the scenes, when we can be with it in that non-judgmental way that you were just talking about, with some understanding of emptiness, that I think that's when we start to divest ourselves of it or be a little bit freed from an exclusive identification with the kind of person we think we are. So that's what I'm shooting for. And, and can that happen in therapy? I think that's the big question in the, in the book. Can that only happen in the in the uh, at uh, at the forest refuge? You know, after two weeks after a month, you know, after three months? Or can that happen in a sacred psychotherapy space? Can we get a hint of that? What's the answer? Once in a while. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time trying. It's happened for, I think when I was in therapy, I had experiences like that, you know, where I was lucky enough to find uh, Vipassana when I was 20 years old. You know, I did a lot of retreats in my 20s and uh, had my first really good therapy sort of late in my 20s. So I could see how, I could feel how similar things were happening and the therapy could get at certain aspects of myself that hadn't come into awareness on retreat. The interpersonal aspect of the therapy brought out stuff I wasn't aware of about how I held myself, how my anxiety um, uh, was operating subliminally and affecting the way I spoke, the way I sat, the way I moved, the muscles in my face, all that stuff. So then I could sort of put it together that I could then start to feel it in the meditation also. That has absolutely been my experience too, that both modalities are incredibly helpful and can feed upon one another in a positive way. I do want to ask a question that I that came up in my mind as I was listening to you talk about this self-liberation that can either happen on the cushion or on the couch, in the chair, whatever furniture you're sitting on, 
this self-liberation can allegedly happen. And even for somebody listening to this, I imagine that question might be coming up in some minds, certainly came up in my mind of, okay, yeah, I've had some moments in meditation or in therapy or just free range living where I do see through or to stay with your language tweak, I do sort of feel some pattern, maybe my anger, let's say, and I can get a sense of its insubstantiality. And that can feel liberating in the moment. And yet when I go back to living, I just say something that ruins the next 48 hours of my marriage just because I'm overcome with some peak or whatever. I just see the same pattern reasserting itself and I can get into a spiral of, well, all this work you've done is for nothing. I'll say one thing that I mentioned this to a friend recently. uh, And he said, something that his therapist said to him when he was making a similar complaint. And the therapist had said to him, okay, well, was it a little bit less bad than the last time it happened? And that was a very comforting thing to hear, even if several steps removed. Does any of that make any sense to you? Do you have anything you want to add? I don't really think we change ourselves that much. I think the fact that that you see it or feel it and have that moment of liberation from it. And then you're back in your life and back in your world and you're yourself again and as vulnerable to everything as you always have been. I think that's true for all of us. And yet the repetitive seeing of it allows, I I like this idea of rupture and repair like in relationships, but also in terms of one's own relationship to oneself, you know, that you you keep stumbling over yourself and then having to uh, repair it. And that's w- when Winnicott talks about mothers and their children, he's saying that's what's happening all the time, rupture and repair. And it's the parents' capacity to keep coming back even when their feelings are hurt, that creates a sense for the child of, oh yeah, the world is a safe place, or emotional life is like not threatening, or intimacy is possible. You know, that's the whole attachment theory idea with intimacy. But I think meditation and and also therapy is teaching us how to do that for ourselves. So it's a kind of humbling, like when you talk about that, you're very good at talking about that, about how 10%, but I'm still an asshole kind of thing. And that's because that's, it's not true that you're still an asshole, but it's true. That's everybody's experience. And one of the things that's been really, I think, so helpful about the work that you've been doing is that you're not dressing it up and trying to make it be something more than it can be. It's just great to be able to uh, see that my own worst, most intense outrage about the way the world is treating me doesn't have to be the last word, even when I keep feeling that way. And um, that's, I think, the greatest thing that I learned from teaching a little bit with uh, Robert Thurman. He really understands the Tibetan Buddhist you know, speaks Sanskrit, speaks Tibetan, you know, translated for the Dalai Lama, doesn't put meditation on a pedestal, but talks about how important the conceptual understanding of all of this stuff is. And uh, he always highlights this idea of injured innocence, that in order to understand selflessness, in order to understand the emptiness of self, we first have to find the self as it actually appears to us in our own inner subjective experience. Like, who do I really think I am? And so he says, what one of the Tibetan Buddhist teachings is that the best time to find the self that doesn't exist is when someone who you love accuses you of doing something that you didn't do, of hurting their feelings or of being an asshole or whatever. And so you have the feeling of, wait a minute, I didn't do that. How can she think that about me? So there's the self that doesn't exist is right there in that feeling of injured innocence. And a lot of times people come to therapy with exactly that kind of resentment or um, hurt. And there's the self, there's the precious self that at its essence, to use that word again, is emptiness. Then that's the self-liberation thing. If you can really be with that feeling, 
oh my God, like, where did it go? And uh, Thurman leads a meditation that I've heard many times of trying to zero in on that self. And he says, it's like a dog chasing its own tail, you know, and it makes you a little dizzy because you're trying to find the self. You've got the feeling. How could she think that about me? Okay, where's that feeling of me? Can I find it? Oh, I can almost find it, but it's slipping away. And then it's in the slipping away. Oh, like things are, wait, I don't even know who I am anymore. You know, that's the, there's a, a reparative aspect to that because then we're not so stuck in, in our feelings, although it will come again. Do any of us really know any liberated beings, you know, in the way we imagine a liberated being to be? So I tried to write about Ramdas in this book. That was the other thing that uh, I found myself circling. So I I wrote, you know, a couple of introductory chapters and then a final chapter. And my final chapter ends with a a visit that I uh, made to Ramdas just the year before he died, where he really did achieve, like he he might have really become a saint, Ramdas, you know, where he really virtually became the person he was always pretending to be because of uh, having to labor under the uh, partial paralysis and aphasia of this stroke for 20 years, which he just ended up being so graceful with. So I, I tried to write about being with him in a way that could convey what that might feel like to actually be able to not take oneself so seriously all the time. I want to dive more deeply into Ram Dass in a second, but just I want to go back to something you said a while ago, which was, I don't think people can change that much. I think you said yeah, so, something. Um, something like that. Yeah. We are who we are. Right. So what's the point of doing this meditation? If, you know, the no rupture- point. there's no point. <laughs> if you do it for a point. If you do it for a point, you're stuck. But you know this, you know. Do I? You do. You do. You know this, you, you know. What's the point of doing therapy? What's the point of doing anything? You, you, Because I actually think there is some change you can make. It's just not as, I mean, obviously you just described Ramdas having made some change. So change is possible, I I think. But But he uh, was still himself. He was still himself. Yeah, change is possible. Of course change is possible. Mm -hmm. Change is possible, but we're still ourselves. So, So what's changing, you know? I tell this story a lot about how uh, whenever I go on retreat, you're not supposed to read, you're not supposed to write, but I always sneak a little notebook in with me in case I hear something profound or actually have a revelation, you know, that I can use in a book. So it's a little tiny notebook and uh, there's little scribbles in it. And every 10 years or so, I look through to see if there's anything there I can use. And I find I've written the same thing over and over again every because it sounds so profound every time, but then I forget about it and hear it again. And it's always Joseph saying something like, it's not what you're experiencing that matters. It's not what happens that matters. It's how you relate to it. And the thing that can change is how you relate to whatever. That's what you have control over. And that includes yourself, whoever we take ourselves to be, whoever we find ourselves to be in the world. Like, how much control do I have actually about who I am? Some, but you're a unique person. I'm a unique person. We all come in these incarnations. We come encapsulated in the mind and body with a set of responses, we have some control, not a whole lot. So the pointlessness, the point is to become familiar with ourselves, right? Again, I quote from uh, a big inspiration of mine, Michael Eigen, to become partners with the capacities that constitute us. You know, that's from a psychoanalyst. So that's another way of talking about the full catastrophe, I think to experience the full catastrophe, to become partners with the capacities that constitute us, to inhabit our being fully. What does it mean to inhabit our being fully? To inhabit our being, how much room do we give ourselves and our lives for the pure being of ourselves, you know? Something that's happening in meditation sometimes for sure. Uh, It's something that sometimes I think I try to show how therapy sometimes can encourage that. Much more of my conversation with Dr. Mark Epstein right after this. You really cannot talk about happiness without talking about relationships. 
All the data I've seen seem to indicate that uh, the most important variable when it comes to human flourishing is the quality of your relationships. Personal relationships, professional relationships, your relationship with your own hopes and aspirations, your body, your fears. Now there is a great new podcast where that is all they talk about. It's called Just Curious Relationships. Great advice on your deepest, darkest questions about any relationship tackled by experts who actually know what they're talking about. Check it out. Give it a listen. Find Just Curious Relationships from The Well by Northwell wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We're in a new year. Many people are thinking about how they can be their best selves. I would strongly argue that one of the most powerful levers you can pull when it comes to self-improvement is therapy. I've been talking to my therapist for many years. He helps me with everything from interpersonal conflict to intrapersonal conflict, you know, me fighting with myself, to insomnia, to a recent resurgence of claustrophobia I had, which, by the way, is getting much better with his help. Working with a therapist can genuinely help you get to the best version of you. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's completely online, convenient, flexible, and affordable. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash happier today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash happier. As I understand it, the core change with, with, again, with the caveat that we are still who we are, but as as I understand it, the core change that you're describing, which really stuck out to me because it's something that I've been writing about a lot in in my own book. You you get like two or three books done in the period that takes me to write one book. Something that I've been writing about a lot, and you describe beautifully in this book, is that as we become more familiar, often in a sort of and this is a word you use, taken from the Dalai Lama, in a mocking way, with our own catastrophe, where instead of fighting it so much, and that fighting is like a briar patch, we just get more entangled. It's sort of an involution, a downward spiral that gets tighter and tighter, where you're just more and more in yourself the more you fight these old patterns. If you can be cool with it, if you can be fully who you are, without being owned by these patterns, that I think you're arguing unlocks a kindness, one might say love, that is always there anyway, is obscured by the Mishigas. And that is the hidden kindness in life that you're referencing in your subtitle of your book. Do I have that right? Yeah, you have that absolutely right. I came to the kindness thing in my pursuit of the Zen analogies for what I was doing, uh, I found this book by a, uh, it must be a West Coast uh, therapist and Zen teacher, John Tarrant, I think his name is, called Bring Me the Rhinoceros. And Bring Me the Rhinoceros and Other Zen Koans That Will Save Your Life. And he lists, I think, seven things about koans. Koans show you that you can depend on creative moves, which I think is true about therapy. Koans encourage doubt and curiosity. Koans rely on uncertainty as a path to happiness. Koans will undermine your reasons and your explanations. Koans lead you to see life as funny rather than tragic. Koans will change your ideas of who you are, and this will require courage. Koans reveal a hidden kindness in life. That was his final one. So I read that and I was like, oh yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. So unlocking, uncovering, uncovering a hidden kindness. And that goes back to Winnicott. You know, Winnicott's writing about parenting, having children, having babies. Like, how is it that we are able to take care of these beings? You know, it's so much work, you know, but that He calls it a a maternal aptitude or the primary maternal preoccupation, which I think is present in both men and women, more in women, obviously. Uh, But we're trying to catch up these days. But I think that's a lot what's being taught in meditation is that same, you know, our minds are like the unruly children. And when we're 
adopting the meditative stance, you know, isn't that like being how we have to be as parents, not completely permissive, like seeing things for what they are and um, challenging when it needs to be challenged, but forgiving, you know, ultimately forgiving and holding, et et cetera, et cetera. So, and so that capacity, we were all babies. We all had some of that experience or we wouldn't be talking to each other, you know, or trying to meditate. Some of us are parents, but that capacity is there. It's latent in all of us. That's the idea. And it wants to emerge. It wants to emerge. That's the thing we're taking on faith from the what the Buddha taught. Well, you just got me right to the question I was going to ask. Is this a taking on faith? Is there any evidence? And this is a question I've asked many guests, so I apologize to previous listeners who've heard me flog this uh, dead horse before. But is there any evidence for what some would call Buddha nature, the idea that underneath all the noise, the sound and fury, the sturm and drang, that there is this pure spontaneity and kindness and love. Is that just a faith claim or can we say there's evidence? I think it's just a faith claim. Really? Yeah. I I mean, obviously, there's a whole industry, and I don't mean that as a put down, There's a whole industry that's devoted to trying to prove that it does exist, that what's been taken on faith for all of these hundreds and thousands of years coming from spiritual teachers of all kinds, not just the Buddha, that there's a loving energy that permeates the universe, you you, you know. You know and I know uh, various neuroscientists who have shown incredible things, you you know, that uh, brain changes are possible, do happen through the application of these techniques, etc. But um, I started out with those people. I even started the book with a, a whole description of working with Herbert Benson, who was a cardiologist at Harvard, who did the first... Uh, work on transcendental meditation showing that it evokes what he called the relaxation response and could be used to combat stress response and hypertension. He used it to help people lower their blood pressure. And uh, I worked with him for seven years all through medical school. And we went to India on a research project uh, spearheaded by uh, interactions we had with the Dalai Lama to measure the body temperatures of advanced yogis doing uh, heat yoga where they could sit outside in the frozen Himalayas and dry wet sheets with the heat of their bodies. And we hiked into the uh, wilderness and measured their body temperatures and wrote scientific papers about it, etc. But the art of meditation was always what was more intriguing to me than the science of it. So I'm willing to be inspired by the sutras and by the teachers who uh, at their best seem to embody, you know, that, oh yes, this is real, (laughs) this thing. And for me, you know, when I started to seriously meditate, meaning do a 10 day or two week silent retreat, which is as serious as I've ever gotten with it, things really started to happen. It wasn't just a struggle to meditate. It was actually, there's a whole movie there. Like, it's really deep, this thing. So I'm willing to uh, accept on uh, some kind of faith-based something that some of this must be true. Like, how do we deal with death? Like, do we think we're all operating with the scientific materialistic way of thinking about death that we were brought up with? But... uh, I don't have that much trouble reaching for the idea of something continuing, something personal slash impersonal continuing. Is is there any proof of that? Um, Little bits of anecdotal something of uh, people almost dying or uh, uh, four-year-olds almost remembering past lives. Who knows? But what do we choose to believe? Or what do we feel? Are we just making it up? Are we just hoping? At some point, it becomes very real when uh, when it's you that's facing death or people you love. I um, gone on a little bit of an arc personally with rebirth because it was the type of idea that, as was and still kind of is my want, um, I reflexively dismissed as folklore. 
And over time, I don't know why this sort of inchoate, incipient suspicion has arisen in my mind from being caught up in the affinity scam of uh, Buddhists who have a similar background to me, so I feel comfortable uh, in hearing too many Dharma talks or maybe just, you know, little glimmers of something in my own meditation. And then also sitting in, I was watching Joseph Goldstein, who we've discussed a little bit, was staying over recently at our house, and he and I watched some of this Netflix documentary, Surviving Death, and there's an episode about this University of Virginia professor who goes and interviews kids who have memories of past lives, and he does all these very interesting tests on them, and they just pass with, at least the video that I saw. The, the, really? These kids, oh, I haven't seen this. It's uh-huh. shocking, and and it's just <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. It, it's very convincing. that He's showing them pictures of like three women in front of them. One of them was the mother of the person they claimed that they were in a former life, and they can pick out the mom, even though they've never seen the picture. They can like point out a local playground that they played at. Very, very interesting. Yeah. That's a digression, though. On Ram Dass, can you describe who he is? And then I want to talk about a few of the things he said to you that were so influential in your life and in your therapy. Yeah. Well, if you go back far enough in this uh, uh, Buddhist world, you you come to uh, Timothy Leary and, and Richard Alpert, who were Harvard psychology professors in the 1960s, who were among the first to... Um, partake of uh, first psilocybin and then LSD. And they came at it from the place of being serious, at least semi-serious psychologists and uh, curious about, oh my God, what is this thing? What's it telling us about the mind? Could it be useful for the treatment of uh, this or that, you know, prisoners, alcoholics, whatever. But it was the beginning of the 60s and the substances were incredibly uh, beguiling and I think seductive and interesting. And the culture was such that um, they certainly were not careful if they wanted to keep their academic jobs. And they were giving the psychedelics to students. And anyway, they got in trouble and either encouraged to quit or in Ram Dass's and Richard Alpert. Richard Alpert was his name. Uh, in his case, he was uh, asked to leave. And the chairman of the department in those days, who both hired him and then fired him, was still teaching by the time I got to Harvard, which was in 1971. So his name was David McClellan. And um, although he fired Albert and Leary, he stayed friendly with Albert, who, after being let go from Harvard, went on a spiritual expedition to India, hoping to find sages who could uh, tell him something about what the psychedelics were showing him about his mind. So he went in search of spiritual teachers, masters, etc., and stumbled upon what sounds like was a true uh, teacher whose name was Neem Karoli Baba, or they called him Maharaji, who only lived for a short time, a couple of years, after Richard Alpert found him, Neem Karoli Baba renamed him Ram Das, servant of Ram, servant of God, Das being servant, Ram being a name of a Hindu name of God, and told him not to talk about it at all, not to talk about him or anything. But Ram Das couldn't control himself, came back to America, went on the radio, went to Wesleyan, where he had been a graduate student, went to Harvard, uh, couldn't stop talking about it, and ended up bringing back a whole bunch of other uh, basically young hippie children in those days who uh, flocked to Neem Karoli Baba's uh, ashram and had a a life-changing experience of something. Again, long story. One of those early disciples of uh, the guru was uh, a fellow named Daniel Goleman, who many of us still know, who went on to write a book called Emotional Intelligence. He was a graduate student in psychology at Harvard when I got there. So my second year, the graduate student teaching fellow in the psychophysiology class I was taking was Daniel Goleman, who in those days had a a whole lot of frizzy hair and was wearing purple bell-bottom pants when I walked into the class. And I knew he knew something that I needed to know. And so I befriended him. And uh, he already knew Joseph and uh, Sharon and Ram Dass, obviously. And so he sort of set me on the path. So 
that psychology professor who had hired and fired Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary, whose name was David McClellan, had a, a big yellow house on the top of the highest hill in Cambridge that he and his wife, who was a, a wonderful woman, Mary McClellan, a painter, they were both Quakers, they opened their house to all of the young people who had been in India with Alpert, now Ramdas, and uh, turned it into a kind of traveling way station for people on the spiritual path while I was in college taking his motivation class. So once I met Danny Goldman and went to Naropa and met Joseph and so on, I realized that, oh, my professor was secretly hosting Trumpa and Ramdas and all of these people. So I started to hang out at the house and got to know Ramdas then a little bit myself. He was 20 years older than me, had been at Harvard, had been a psychologist. I think saw in me that I was a generation later and didn't need to make the same choices that he had made. So I was able to straddle the line a a little more easily than he was, you know, going on to uh, go to medical school and become a psychiatrist and so on. But he was always very kind to me. Uh, And uh, for a couple of years, he taught these like, um, I wouldn't exactly call them secret, but they were um, small meditation classes in the carriage house of David McClellan's, the professor's big house in Cambridge. So I got to know him as his student, friend kind of thing. And then as I continued in in my life, Ram Dass moved to California. I lost track of it. We stayed in touch just a little bit, but I would see him periodically every couple of years. But there was one one point where I traveled in Asia with Joseph and Sharon and Jack and uh, Ramdas joined us for a trip to Jack's monastery in Thailand where Ajahn Chah was teaching. And so we shared a couple of intense experiences. So anyway, I had a relationship with him that extended through 40 years or so. Uh, and he was an important mentor figure for me, turned out to be in a lot of different ways. Yeah. He said a few things to you that you write about in the book that really influenced your therapy. I'll read a few of the things he said, and you can just pick whatever ones you want to talk about as it relates to the book or how we can incorporate this wisdom into our lives. But one thing he said to you when talking to you about your early therapy practice was, do you see them, your patients, as already free? A few other things he said to you that really come up throughout the book is one is the notion of loving the thoughts, your own thoughts, and seeing yourself as a soul, which is not a, not a particularly Buddhist thing to say. It's a good thing for the Buddhists. Yeah. (laughs) It's a good corrective, I think. Multiple choice, or you could do them all, but just pick one or two and just talk a little bit about the influence. Well, when I first met Ram Dass, it was when I went out to Naropa I was like 20 years old and Danny Goldman sent me out to Naropa. He said, if you want to learn more about this, go. all my friends are going to be teaching there, so go there. So I went there and Ram Dass was teaching this big, extraordinary, it was like it was like the real Woodstock, but it was 1974 and the, still dressed in Indian garb and all his people on stage playing uh, Indian instruments and chanting, you know, it was, and I was besotted with the whole thing. So it was possible to have a one-on-one meeting with him. So I signed up for a one-on-one meeting and um, I went into his like townhouse that they had given the people there. And he was sitting on a cushion and I sat on a cushion opposite him and he didn't say anything, just stared at me. And we sat silently, you know, and this is a thing Ram Dass did, it turns out. But for me, it was, you know, I felt like I was the only one that was having this experience. And he just sat silently looking at me, staring at me, probably staring at my third eye, you know, until I broke and finally got so anxious that I had to say something. But right at that breaking point, he said, he actually broke it, I think, and and said, uh, are you in there? You know, meaning in here, are you in there? I'm in here. And then he said, far out, you know, which is how he would talk. So he was, I think, trying to convey in his slightly uh, affected way in those days, what I'm trying to convey in the book in a 
my own affected way, that there's something underlying where we come with our minds, we come with our anxieties, but behind that, there's something more impersonal that links us. So that, that was actually my first experience of him. Then, blah, 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 everything I said already, he had his stroke, and it was 20, 25, 23 years later, and I was in, in my early 40s, and married and had children and was, you know, a psychiatrist already. And I went out to uh, California and I went to visit him and he was living in Tiburon. And I think he'd had the stroke a year before. And he was on the porch of his house. And I drove up to see him and uh, nervous because of how much I, I admired him. And uh, we were sitting on the porch together he couldn't talk very well. His speech came back a little bit. Every word he had to find, and it took a long time, but he joked with me right away. He's like, uh, oh, so you're, you're a, um, are you a Buddhist psychiatrist now? He's, he said to me, I'm like, yeah, I guess I, I, guess I am, you know, a um, Buddhist psychiatrist. And then it took him a really long time. He said, do you see them as already free. I was like, what? You know, like I first had to put the words together, you know, like, do you see them as already free? Do you see them as already? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think I do actually, but I could never have articulated it that way, but he did. And when I'm, when I was writing the book, I think I actually told that story in an earlier book, but when I was writing the book, I was trying to remember like, like I spent all that time, did those classes with Ram Dass. Like, what did he ever say that, that, I, that I can remember? <laughs> you know, he said, you're not who you think you are. He would repeat that all the time. You're not who you think you are, which I loved as someone who had retreated to my mental uh, faculties as a coping mechanism to get me through life. You're not who you think you are. Do you see them as already free? So that I have taken as a, the sort of, what, what's the word, like the, the light motif? So that I thought was beautiful. And my own first therapist, whose name was is Michael Vincent Miller, who maybe you have met also. I have definitely met him, yes. He said something uh, that I also quoted in the book. When he was my therapist, he wasn't deep into Buddhism, but um, we became friends after he was my therapist, and now he's done a lot of retreats. Uh, and I had a conversation with him that I recount in the book about how Buddhism and psychotherapy um, are the same. And he said, oh, the way that they're the same is that they're both about restoring innocence after experience, reclaiming, refinding, restoring innocence after experience. I think that's almost the same as, do you see them as already free? Because we think we know ourselves through our experience, that experience is everything, you know? but that there's something beyond experience or something before experience that is in hiding, that we're in search of. And Ramda said one of his other refrains later in life was, we're all walking each other home, which I also like. As a therapy, you know, like, what are we doing together? We're all walking each other home. So what's the home? Because that makes sense. I can feel the truth of that. And that's even something I felt in meditation and, and sitting like, ah, like, like, oh, I'm so glad I found this. Like, oh, the sense of coming home. And a lot of those Zen poems circle that idea too. That's what I liked about writing the book the best, actually, that those poems started to come alive. So for me personally, I think those were the Ram Dass things that made the most difference. One of my patients who I talk about in the book, very close to Ram Dass, and um, knew him better than I did, really. Went to see him periodically and then would come back and uh, talk to me in therapy about what his exchange with Ram Dass was and uh, how helpful it, it was. And uh, he tells the story that I recount in the book of confessing to Ram Dass about all his lurid sexual thoughts, objectifying the other sex, and how he couldn't stop, but knew it was wrong or, or objectionable, but loved it and it needed to keep doing it. And Ram Dass's intervention first was love the thoughts, you know, rather than 
all the complicated thing that he was doing with them. And then he said, but try to see yourself as a soul. So what's he saying there? Because then he said, because then if you can see yourself as a soul, maybe you could start to see them, the women, you know, as souls rather than as simply objects of desire, etc. So what does that mean to see yourself as a soul? I think it connects to innocence after experience and already free and to whatever that is that's in the background of our experience that in meditation we're trying to bring to the foreground that I'm hoping therapy can also help to bring to the foreground. So Ramdas wasn't afraid to use the soul word because he's allowing himself to be influenced by that tradition. Buddhism grew up in an environment where people had reified the idea of the soul such that they were seeing it in a transcendent way. So the no-soul doctrine, which has become the no-self doctrine, was trying to counter the way that people had systematized this, the soul idea. But I think it's possible to reclaim the word of it to try to uh, get to whatever that is that is underneath our personalities, you know, that um, we're trying to access in our practice. So Ram Dass is saying through all these expressions that you picked up the same thing that you're trying to say in the book, which is, can we, as counterintuitive it, as it may seem, love all of our <laughs> unruly <laughs> neuroses, all of this stuff, because then that puts us in touch with the mystery that underlies all of it. And then that allows us to see that that mystery is living in every other sentient being. And that's where the kindness emerges. Yeah. And going back to our earlier discussion about what changes, what doesn't change, Ramdas was very, he was like a stand up comedian when he could talk. So that was one of the. One of the things when he had a stroke and he lost that charm, you know, that he had once had, that was part of his own process. But one of the things he said, I think when he could still uh, talk uh, the pants off of you, you, you know, was uh, first, originally his neuroses were like these big monsters in the room, you, you, you know, and after all his therapy and psychedelics and spiritual life and so on, it's not, none of them went away, but they became like delightful little schmooze. So that I like, that recalibration. I think I put this in the book. My, my big revelation on my, that last visit with Ramdas, we were we were riding in the car on the way to the beach. He would go swimming once a week and his the people who were taking care of him were driving uh, him to the beach and I was in the back seat. And they put a tape on of Ramdas when he could talk like in the 70s doing his routine. And we're, so we're listening to it. And I said to him, like, was that all scripted or was it improvised? That was my first question. And he said, improvised. And then I said, how did you learn how to do that? And he said, my father raised money for Jewish charities, which, <laughs> so you could just imagine like going to the galas and having to schmooze the audience for, uh, uh, he grew up listening to that. So I thought that was very revelatory. Mark, this has been a pleasure, a delight, and... Thank you for writing the book. It's a great book. And congratulations on the publication. Thanks. Thanks again to Mark. This show is made by Samuel Johns, Gabrielle Zuckerman, DJ Kashmir, Justine Davey, Kim Baikama, Maria Wortel, and Jen Poyant with audio engineering from our good friends over at Ultraviolet Audio. We'll see you all on Wednesday for a brand new episode about depression, especially uh, how winter can affect depression with Sona Demidjian. That's coming up on Wednesday. Hey, hey, Prime members. You can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. 
With classes in crisis communication, influence, and data presentation, Gonzaga University's online Master's in Communication and Leadership equips you with the tools you need to communicate clearly and encourage creativity in any industry. Concentrations in digital media, strategic communication, and global leadership allow you to customize your degree. Visit gonzaga.edu slash communication and learn why a master's degree from Gonzaga can help you take your career to the next level. That's gonzaga.edu slash communication. In business, competition is the key to success. Every product you own, from the shoes on your feet to the phone in your hands, got there because of cutthroat business decisions. And Wondery's podcast, Business Wars, brings you stories about the most well-known companies in the world and how the decisions they make shape what you buy and how you live. With over 50 seasons to choose from, you'll hear about the fight for your feet with Nike versus Adidas, the battle to control the smartphone market with iPhone versus BlackBerry, or the game-changing company that is Tesla and Elon Musk's bid to take on the entire auto industry. Business Wars covers every sector from fashion to food, tech to travel, sports to pop culture, and more. These stories are entertaining, fun, eye-opening, and will help you understand a little bit more about the world around you. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.